my name is Adit and welcome to Simply Divine. So, the universe has been around for a long, long time. 13.7 billion years to be in, in fact. To just put in perspective how big 13.7 billion years is, the entire radius of the solar system is only around 7 or 6 billion kilometers. Or the entire population of planet Earth is only around 8 or eight or seven billion people or the entire existence of our home solar system is only 4.5 billion years so yes the universe has been around for a very long time but how did all of this come to be how did everything in the universe black holes stars galaxies planets planetesimals dwarf stars etc how, how did all of this amazing wonders came into being well Let's find out. And before we do find out, please support this channel by subscribing and click the bell icon so that you can be notified every time I post a new video. So, to study the past, we need a way to look into the past. And how do we look into the past? And the only way we could do that is exploiting a nature of light. Now, most people see light as something non-tangible something that comes out of your bulb so you just brush it away in your daily life but we need to look at light as something much more we need to look at it as something tangible it's as a form of matter or something that it's there it's at, it has a physical form it has photons in it right so we need to understand light in a different way and when we do that that then we understand that light travels from one place to another for example light from the sun takes eight minutes to reach the planet earth and light also helps us see everything around us when you turn on your bulb the light bounces back into your desk and then comes back into your eyes and your brain perceives as what color is it in my case it's blue so light helps us to perceive the world around us and see what it is so the light from the sun takes eight minutes to travel to us and we see that light and we perceive as whatever the color the sun is. You look up into the sky, you see the sun, you get to know if it's white, orange or red or whatever you see it, see it as. But the thing is, the important point here is light takes 8 minutes. That means that whatever you're seeing about the sun, all the information you get from looking at the sun, all the visual information is happening 8 minutes in the past. Because 8 minutes is the time it took here. We are only seeing what's happening 8 minutes in the past of the sun, right? So that means we can't never really see what's happening at that moment. Even when you're looking around the, your room or wherever you're sitting, you're actually seeing it even milliseconds in delay. There's no actual way to see it in perfect live time. We can use this nature to study the young universe. For example, if there's a planet millions of thousands of light years away from us people living there when studying our planet will only see dinosaurs because dinosaurs light have reached them our light still has not it's still traveling towards them so they will see whatever is happening in the past of our planet and not in the present and we can reverse this nature and whenever we see a distant star or maybe a distant galaxy we are seeing what's happening in the past of the galaxy and not in the present so not of it is real time it might be already dead the star but we see it as alive well and young so the further we look the, for the more distance we look into the universe the younger the universe gets so this is how we study the universe's past now what have the studies revealed and what is the best theory to understand how the universe came into existence the thousands of theories of how it came but the most believed and probably the most true one is the Big Bang, which all of you might have heard of. So, what happened in the Big Bang? Well, before the Big Bang, there was practically nothingness and that's what we think. There was nothingness and there's probably no way to know what happened before the Big Bang. But when the universe burst into existence and we need to slow down time by milliseconds to see what's happening because everything is happening really really fast this small burst is expanding into millions and billions of light years in just seconds right so let's just slow down time and let, let's take a closer look and what we see is 
photons and leptons and bosons and uh, quarks and all of these small small subatomic particles just zipping around in this tiny young universe right and then the universe is expanding really really fast and these particles are spreading everywhere and some of them just fusing into each other or combining to create sub subatomic particles like neutrons electrons and protons and these are neutron electron protons combining to create the first ever atom in the universe which is hydrogen hydrogen being the simplest lightest and the least massed atom in the universe was also the first atom to be ever created so in this expanding young universe there was an abundance of hydrogen and a little bit of helium and in some of these places there was just these pockets of hydrogen and a little bit of helium called as nebulae. Nebulae are places with condensed material and condensed gravity and this con gra high and strong gravities in nebulae cause the hydrogen to fuse into each other and this process is called nuclear fusion. Fusing two atoms together creates a huge burst of energy. Fusing a simpler atom creates more energy. So fusing two hydrogen creates a huge burst of energy which the gravity contains and turns into a circle. And the more and more fusion it does, the larger the star gets. And all this fusion is happening in the core of the star. So this is how the first stars came into existence, right? So in this core, there's rapidly this process of hydrogen turning into helium and hydrogen turning into helium again and again and again. And the star's radiation, which is the outwards force, and the star's gra gravity, that is the inwards force, are equal and it's in an equilibrium state, right? So what happens is that over time, this hydrogen runs out. What all of it has turned into helium. And helium, when being fused in the stage 2 of nuclear fusion, does not create as much energy. That means the equilibrium is broken and this average size star cannot really keep this matter around it, uh, holding it together because the, the radiation is just going away. It's radiating away. So the outside layers of this star just evaporates away. And this out outer layer has a lot of hydrogen because, you know, after the fusion, this radiation just goes outwards of the star. Like an, like if you see the layers of an onion, you can see that the outside layers of the star has more hydrogen than the core because all the hydrogen has been pushed outwards. So this gas just evaporates away, leaving only the core, which dies out and turns into a black dwarf. And now bigger stars have a different case, but I'll explain that in a different video. So... What happens is that this evaporated away uh, highly hydrogen condensed gas turns into a new nebula and that creates new stars. So basically this is just a star's life cycle process or star's reproduction you can say it as. And this is how more and more stars came into being. And more stars means more gravity in the universe. And in this huge universe this gravity pulled some of the stars together to create uh, clusters and this clusters created galaxies. Now, where did planets come into the fray? Well, if you look at some stars, in individual stars, you can see that there's thousands of space debris and dust just swirling around around the star, right? It's in orbit, and these dusts and grains of space debris have what we call microgravity. And microgravity pulls them together, creating bigger pieces of space debris. Those create bigger pieces and it goes into a faster orbit around the sun. And then what happens is that this pieces turns into what we call planetesimals. Planetesimals are, are basically big asteroids. They are like one of the biggest asteroids. You can be call the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs as a planetesimals, right? These planetesimals combined together creating dwarf planets and in the early solar system or let's just take our solar system for the rest of this journey for sake of simplicity there were thousands of uh, dwarf stars hundreds of them around our solar system or are circling our sun and because there were so many of these dwarf stars the early solar system was a chaotic place right all of these Dwarf stars just colliding with each other, many of these debris just flowing out into the void of space. All of these actions are happening in the solar system. And what happens is that when two dwarf stars, dwarf planets collide, 
they create a bigger planet yeah and you can call it a planet because it's big enough and more and more dwarf stars were decreasing and the amount of planets were increasing and these planets uh, the amount of planets kept decreasing until it reached to uh, 20 or 30 planets and at that time we we had the young earth and the young earth was bigger than the earth that we live in now and what happened is that a planet the size of mars collided with the earth and a huge part of the earth just flew into space and started orbiting the earth just like the planets orbit the sun and what happened is that the same principle how rocks around the sun turn into planets in the same way the debris circling the earth turn into the moon so now we have eight planets the earth and the moon F from there what happened so how did we get water because water is the building block for life so how water came we have multiple theories for example comets are basically full a uh, chunk of ice they are full of waters and during the early earth there were a lot of meteor showers and the earth was really hot so water in comets just crashed into the earth that water evaporated into h2o clouds and when the earth when the sun started to cool down a, a bit the and the earth was in the right position or as the position it is currently it entered in the place called the goldilocks zone what is the goldilocks zone so basically goldilocks zone is a place where it's neither too hot or neither too cold and water can be in its liquid form for example if we look at venus or mercury we can see that it's too close to the sun and it's too hot and water is always evaporating or maybe water that can't even exist in in planets like those or if you look at places beyond the earth like mars jupiter or uh, neptune uranus uh, and saturn these places are much further away from the sun so they are too cold for uh, water to exist in liquid form they just turn into ice or water may can't even exist there so that means life cannot be or will be very difficult to exist in these two places but when it's in the right spot from the sun where where there's not extreme heat or extreme cold there life water can be liquid and there life can develop and what happened is that in these craters where the old meteoroids have hit there they turn into water basins water rained down after the earth cooled down and turned into huge oceans and water came into life and life led to life on land and that evolved into reptiles reptiles evolved into mammals mammals evolved finally to us and here we are of 13.7 billion history behind us right and no one knows what is happening what's going to happen in the future but we know that there's a lot more in the future than there is in the past because compared to the age of the universe 13.7 billion is a minute number and we could see the universe still as a baby so let's see what happens in the future and that's it for today